ever seen me. Anyways, welcome. My wife and I are the campus pastors at Oasis Church Cattle Mills, East Texas, about 30, 35 minutes away from the main location, which is where I'm currently at here in Rollette. 5700 Mark Lane, if you ever want to come to an amazing church that's on fire for the Lord, and I really mean on fire for the Lord. There are some hungry people up in this place. And then if you live out in Hunt County and you want to come to an amazing church out there with some hungry people that are on fire, my wife and I would love to meet you. So you should come on out, hang out with us, and we love to party for Jesus, party with the Holy Ghost. We love to get baptized with the only fire that it's the fire that only Jesus baptizes with. And it's great. So you should come out, hang out. Welcome to the podcast today. And my time has shifted from Mondays to Wednesdays. And so I'm glad to be with you. I want to greet all the viewers, anybody watching now, maybe you're watching even a year from now, maybe you're watching six hours from now. I don't know when you're going to be tuning in, but welcome. Great to have you. And I want to go ahead and encourage you, share this post, get the word out about the message and the topic that I'm going to be sharing. It could really help somebody, not because I'm sharing it, but because the word of God is powerful. So, welcome. Welcome. Great to have you. My wife's actually going to be going live after this, so you're going to want to just stay tuned. She'll be going live at 1230. You're not going to want to miss what she has to bring to the table. And uh, this table, your table, maybe it's your car, maybe it's your supper table. I mean, I, I don't know what table you're going to be sitting at, but you might be sitting at a table. You might be sitting at your desk at work. You might be in a cubicle right now. Anyways, I'm excited. I'm trying to see, I see a comment up there, I see a comment, but anyways, welcome, let's dive in, I want to talk to you for a few moments about a topic that um, is going to help you, and this is a topic that never gets old, it's a topic that is a, it's a, it's kind of a topic that no matter what season you are in life, it's important, it's valuable. And I want to talk to you about, and just hang with me, you're, you're, you're going to see where I'm going with this, but I want to talk to you about sure ways to have little success and little breakthrough. How many of you guys want to have little success and little breakthrough? So that's the point, right? Nobody wants to have little success and little breakthrough, at least if they're a smart person. They want to have big success. They want to have big breakthrough. And God's called us to be a people of breakthrough. The Bible says God's got a plan for us. It's a plan to prosper us. It's a plan that leads us into what he defines as success. There's many people right now pursuing, they're pursuing their own agenda. They're pursuing their own will. And it's what they want to do. And they're not doing what God's called them to do. And that's the world's definition of success, but that's not God's definition of success. But I want to talk to you about sure ways to make sure that you receive or achieve very little success and very little breakthrough. So you can do the opposite of what we're about to dive into today. Just side note, this is my wife and I's Bob Ross coffee cup, if you can see it. So when it gets hot, there's a painting that pops up right there. And obviously my coffee is not hot, so... Let's dive in though. I want to I want to talk to you about honor. I want to talk to you about submission to authority. Um, the Bible talks about how the authority that that's in place God has put in place. All authority is instituted by the Lord, and we have to understand those of us who have Christ in our life. We've said yes to Jesus. And just side note, saying yes to Jesus isn't saying a prayer. Saying yes to Jesus is following Christ. It's denying yourself. It's picking up your cross, and it's following him. It's not, it's not this American Christian gospel that says, I said a prayer, and I can keep living like the devil, talking like the devil, acting like the devil, thinking like the devil. And, and let me tell you, it's not all just straight up you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll as it relates to living like the devil. It's pursuing our own agenda. It's pursuing our own will. 
It's not being bought into the kingdom of God. It's not serving the bride of Christ. It's not following the leading of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's when, we, when we don't say yes to Jesus in the sense of being all in, then we stop following Jesus. To follow Jesus, it's an all in. It's an all in. It's an all in pursuit. It's not a 50% pursuit. It's not a 99.9% pursuit. It's, it's I am all in. When you think about what Jesus has done for you, it makes no sense for us not to be all in. And so he gave his life, and in return, we're called to give our life. And the Holy Spirit will help us as to what we need to cut out of our lives, what we need to say no to so we can continue to say yes to him. So it may not be that you understand and know everything you've got to say no to right now, but the Holy Spirit will lead you. And that's the main thing. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. Let him lead you into this. This is the gospel. The gospel is not I go to church once a year, once a month, even once a week. We've made, we've made church and we've made following Jesus. I go to church and, um, and then, you know, there's some people who pay their tithe and there's other people who don't, but they still think they're following Jesus. It's not about like I serve once a month and, and so I'm all in. All in means I cut everything out of my life that needs to be cut out that is not a distraction from my relationship with Jesus. It is not, it's not just serving the bride. Many people think following Jesus is why well, I serve my local church. That's great. You need to. But that's not, that is not the end game. It is, I am so in love with Jesus. Sometimes, sometimes we work so much for the Lord that we don't allow the Lord to work in us. You can't be so focused on working for the Lord that we, that we don't stop to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us. It's an all-in pursuit. I can't, I can't just go home and bake for my wife, even though I don't know how to bake, but I can't go home and cook for my wife and, 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 and clean the house for my wife and then ignore her and then say, yeah, we're in love and we have a great relationship. It's not just me serving her and like practical needs. It's me going all in and spending time with her and having conversation with her and, and, and having emotional connection and having having that relationship that runs deep to where there's no other woman that's going to get the time of day um, like, like I give my wife. There's not going to be any TV show that I love more than I love my wife. There, there, it's, but today in America, what we have is we got a lot of people. you got some people who are on fire. you got the remnant that God is cranking the heat up in, and, and, and the remnant, they're becoming more aware of their purpose in the earth. And, and then you have the average American believer who is just off in their own little world thinking that they're serving Jesus when really they're serving their own agenda and their own will, which if you look at the Satan church, that's what the Satan church motto is. Do what thou will. Many people are following the church of Satan, not even the church of Jesus, because they're pursuing their own will and their own agenda. They go to church. They go to a Christian church on a Sunday, but their heart says, I follow Satan church because they're pursuing their own will. I'm telling you, it's going to be an interesting day it's going to be an exciting day for a lot of people who have bought all in, and it's going to be a scary day for a lot of people who thought they were saved, but they weren't saved when Jesus comes and, and raptures up his church. So right now, if you're listening, if you're pursuing your own agenda, your own will, you need to stop what you're doing, cut it out immediately as fast as you can, and go all in for Jesus. It has nothing to do with how much money you make. It has nothing to do with with um, the money that you make or whatever the cost it is that, that you've got to shift gears to go all in and do what God's called you to do. God has designed every single one of us with a purpose. He's designed every single one of us and created us to do something significant for his glory. And so you need to stop what you're doing and, and evaluate your life. If you're in real estate, which my wife used to be in real estate, and we made she made good money. We made good money. Uh, yeah, she made good money. Um, I didn't make the money. She did. She's the one who got her license. She's the one who did it. So, <laughs> I mean, I guess for one. So technically, yeah, okay, we made the money. No, she made the money. But here's the deal. It was good money, but then the Lord said, freeze your license. It's just because God moves you into a season where you're blessed doesn't mean that's the end game for you. There are many people who God blesses their business, but then in a moment, God could shift gears for them and say, okay, now I want you to focus on this. You've got to be willing to let go. Hang on to whatever you're doing loosely. Hang on to whatever you're doing loosely because at any moment, hang on to it close enough to where if you know God's called you to do it, you do it. 
But then if God says, shift gears and do this, you can let go of it, not a problem, and you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's what this life is about. God knows what's best for us. He knows exactly what's best for us. He knows exactly what we need, when we need it, how we need it. He, he, he has our best interest in mind. So it makes no sense for me to want to hang on to my own agenda when I truly believe that God has his best interest in mind for me. So just understand God's got something amazing in store for you, but it may not be what you're doing right now. Six months from now, you could be doing something completely different because the Holy Spirit led you into something. So, go all in. What we're going to talk about right now is some sure ways that you will not find much success and some sure ways that you will not find much breakthrough. And I want to talk to you about honor and submission. Submission to authority within the house of God, to your leaders and pastors, to staff, to those that you're underneath, whatever serve team you may find yourself on. I want to talk to you about submission and authority and honor to your boss at work. This applies across the board. This isn't just for the local church. This is across the board. Submission and honor to authority, to police officers. You know, I understand there are bad cops, but there's also good cops. But the Bible doesn't say if there's a bad cop, dishonor them. You honor the person based off the position that they hold. You have, you don't don't honor pastors and leaders only whenever they're perfect. Every person's imperfect. Every person God is working on if if the people allow the, the Lord to work on them. But every person's got imperfections. You have imperfections. I have imperfections. It's funny to me how people will, leave one church and go to another because they got offended by that pastor, that pastor's imperfect. Well, they just stepped into another church where that pastor's imperfect. You know, my wife and I had, we had lunch or dinner one time with a couple, and the guy wasn't being rude towards us. He was just hurt by by a previous church and, I guess, specifically pastor. And he made the comment, he said, I'm just waiting for you guys to let us down, talking to my wife and I. And it was nothing that... It was nothing to take personal. It was just the fact this guy was hurt. And so his perspective was any church I go to, I guess, I'm just going to wait for that pastor to let me down because I got let down in my previous church. And people need healing from that kind of stuff. And only the Holy Spirit can bring that healing. Only the Holy Spirit can bring about that healing. So we have to, we have to obey the Lord regardless of what people do and regardless of what people say. I can't go dishonor just any police officer because there's some bad ones out there. That, that's, that's dishonoring to the Lord. That's dishonoring to the Word of God. I may get some people who don't like this message. It, it's, it's irrelevant. It's about what does God's Word say. It's irrelevant. You know, God brings you to a place to where you love people enough to tell them the truth, and there's some who they're not going to like it, and there's some who's going to love it. And it's not, about, it's not about bringing messages that make people feel good. It's about holding to the standard of the Word of God. That's what this thing is about, holding to the standard. The the gospel, Jesus, by nature, is offensive. He said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. I didn't come to bring, I came to bring a sword. By nature, the gospel is offensive. By nature, Jesus is offensive. By nature, the Word of God is offensive. It's offensive. It's supposed to be offensive. It's supposed to cut, Hebrews 4. The Word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. It cuts between soul and spirit, bone and marrow. It cuts. It hurts. It reveals wrong mindsets and strongholds in our life. It cuts deep. It's not fun. It doesn't feel good. The gospel does not feel good all the time. The gospel is supposed to cut. The gospel is supposed to offend wrong mindsets so that we can reveal what kind of heart we really have. And then once we humble ourselves and we repent of any wrong mindset, the Holy Spirit comes and brings refreshing to our soul. And this is how we mature. This is how we grow. This is what it's about. So I want to talk to you about submission and honor to authority. Submission and honor. Honor is a language of the kingdom of heaven. Honor is a language in the kingdom of heaven. Learning and knowing how to honor 
your leadership. You know, there's a story in the Bible of a prophet where some, where some people in the, in the Old Testament dishonored the prophet and a bear came out and ate them, killed them because of their lack of honor. You got Noah. One of his sons dishonored Noah. And as a result, Noah, it was the guy who built the ark. Noah, let's talk about this story for a minute. Didn't plan on it, but let's go there. I believe it was his youngest son. What happens is the flood is over now. Noah gets drunk on wine. He's laying in his tent. And he is laying in his tent naked. And I believe it was the younger brother who walked in, saw his dad naked, and instead of honoring his father and, and covering up his father's weakness, he dishonors his dad by exposing his father. And his father finds out after he wakes up, and he winds up cursing. He winds up cursing the youngest brother's legacy. Just think about that for a minute. His own father cursed his grandkid. So, honor is a language in the kingdom of heaven. Honor is vital. Honor is important. Honor is honor is what, it's a main key element in what keeps the body of Christ unified. There's a commanded blessing on unity. Honor is part of the glue that holds that together. I don't honor you because of your perfection. I honor you based off the value that heaven has placed on you. If the church could step into that mindset right there, I'm telling you, revival would come to the church and an awakening would come to the lost. You know what the American church needs today? It needs revival. It needs revival. That's what it needs. What's up, Kelly Otter? Honor is key to unity. Yep. Good to see you on here. Hey, babe. My wife's watching. Good to see you on here. I'll see you here in a little bit. So, honor. If you're watching online, type in the comments, honor. Honor is a language. It's a language. Honor can't just be something that we do. It must become a part of who we are. I can't just robotically honor people. I've got to honor people from the compassion of Christ on the inside of my heart. I've got to honor you, not based off of what's what I'm supposed to do and I'm going to go through the motions. That's not true honor. True honor is when I honor you because it's who I am. It's Christ in me. It's, there's a desire in my heart to want to honor you. What happens when we honor people is it, it breeds hope into their life. Honor breeds hope into people's world. Honor, what honor does is it lets people know I believe in you despite of your imperfections. I love you despite of your imperfections. God still has a plan for you despite of your imperfections. That's what honor does. Honor lets people know, even though I've made a lot of mistakes and I don't feel perfect, man, there's still hope for me. God still loves me. People believe in me. What's one of the definitions of love? Always believing in people. According to the word of God, I'll never stop believing in you. So, but when I dishonor, dishonor winds up capping my life. It puts a cap over my life. So these are some sure ways to make sure that you don't you don't find yourself successful in God's eyes and that you don't get the breakthrough that maybe you want to get. If you want to stay living life with little success and little breakthrough, if you want to make sure that you don't get your healing, if you want to make sure that your marriage is never restored, if you want to make sure that your children never surrender to the Lord, then do what I'm about to talk about. And I'm telling you, you won't get the breakthrough you won't, you, won't, you won't get the success that, that God has in store for you. You know, God's not going to just supernaturally cause people to succeed just because he loves humanity. There, there's protocol that we have to participate in with the kingdom of heaven. And then as we participate in, like, I'm not just going to go give my, my kids the keys to the car because they're my kids. They've got to prove themselves. They've got to prove themselves. I'm not just going to go out and, and, and bless my kids when they've been disobedient and dishonoring to their mother or to myself, their dad. There's protocol in the kingdom of heaven, and it's important to understand that honor is vital. Submission to authority. Submission has become a cuss word in the church, hasn't it? It's become a cuss word. 
People obviously in the church have abused submission. Pastors and leaders and staff, they've abused submission. They've, they've used it as a control tactic. But the true nature of submission is not to control people. It's actually, it's actually to, to pour into people and to see them succeed according to the call of God on their life. Submission is actually one of the stepping stones to make sure that you succeed in life according to God's way, not according to the world's way, but according to God's way. So when I look at my authority and I submit to my authority, I don't submit based off of their imperfection or their perfection. I submit because God's called me to serve them. And then whatever is required of me, then I say yes to. If it's within my ability and it's within my means, listen, every person's imperfect, so I don't submit based off of my leader being perfect. I submit based off of, Lord, you've called me to serve this pastor or this leader. I submit based off of, if you're working in a secular job, I submit to my boss based off of, Lord, you called me to this job. You knew the kind of boss I was going to have. You knew that they were going to be imperfect. You knew they were going to have attitudes. So I don't submit only whenever they treat me right. I submit because they are the authority above me. And according to your word, when I submit to them, I'm submitting to you. So let me give you an example. When I was younger, I had I have two over I have two older brothers and at the time my oldest brother Landon was my youth pastor I was on his leadership team and my 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 middle I'm the youngest out of three my middle brother Lauren was the worship pastor and I was on his worship team so now I'm submitted to my dad who's still my senior pastor uh, I was submitted at the time to my brother Landon who was my youth pastor and then I was submitted to my brother Lauren who was my worship pastor and obviously working with your brothers in ministry. It's not always dandelions and roses and tulips and chocolate and, and uh, you know, candles and candy. It's, it can be challenging. So I remember my dad called us all into a meeting in his office. And he basically said, guys, when you fight against each other and when you fight with each other and when you dishonor one of your brothers who's over you in ministry, then you wind up dishonoring me as the, as the pastor who put that brother in charge of that ministry. And what you're saying is you're saying that I did not hear from heaven correctly as to what leader goes in what role. So not only are you dishonoring your brother that I put in charge of that specific ministry, but you're dishonoring me as the pastor of this church. And not only are you dishonoring me as the pastor of this church, you're dishonoring God who put me in charge of this church. There's a chain of command. So let's say you're serving on the greeter team and you have an issue with your greeter leader or you're serving on the usher team or you're serving in the kids ministry and there's a leader on a lower tier that you're submitted to and you're underneath and you have an issue with them. When you go and dishonor them, you're not just dishonoring them, you're dishonoring the leader over that ministry. And not only are you dishonoring the leader over that ministry, you're dishonoring the pastor over that church who put that leader in charge of that ministry. And not only are you dishonoring the pastor of that church, you're dishonoring the elders of that church because they're they're top tier leadership. And then not only are you dishonoring the pastor and the elders, you ultimately are dishonoring the Lord. So how can we expect to receive blessing and breakthrough and success when here we are dishonoring the authority God's called us to stay submitted to? On, listen, honor is not like I keep my mouth shut and I don't say anything and I just I'm just a yes person. Honor is you can still ask questions. You can still say, hey, help me understand why we're doing it this way. Hey, help me understand this. Honor doesn't mean that you cover up sin. What honor means is there's a way to handle imperfections in people's lives without dishonoring them publicly. You can go to your leader if you think there's something wrong in their life, and you can ask them. It's not a matter of like just having little robots in the church. But when you start talking about another leader behind their back to other people and you start creating division, you have just stepped into dishonor. When you meditate on thoughts of dishonor for too long, you've stepped into dishonor. The Bible says Jesus even knew their thoughts. So it's not just even, there's a lot of people who think they're honoring, but in their heart, they dishonor their leader with their thoughts. In their heart, they're dishonoring. They may may be shaking their head, yes, but on the inside, they're shaking their head, no. 
It's like the kid who was in class and kept standing up, and the teacher said, sit down, and he would sit down for a minute but stand back up, and then finally the teacher said, I'm going to send you to the principal's office if you don't sit down. And that kid sat down but said, I just want to let you know, teacher, I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. He's still dishonoring his teacher because he's standing up on the inside. And there's a lot of people in the body of Christ who they're saying yes on the outside, but on the inside they're standing up. They have ought against their leader. They have ought against their pastor. They, they don't agree, and so they begin to talk, and they begin to spread rumors, and they begin to wind up. They, they, they honestly become, they become a critical religious person in the church. And then we wonder why, where's the breakthrough? Where's the healing? Where are the signs? Where are the wonders? Well, dishonor is a sure way to get little success in your life. Lord, where I, I pray and I fast. Yeah, but you dishonor your leadership. Why well, I, I love my pastor. Yeah, but you dishonor your boss at work. You talk bad behind your boss's back. I don't know why they do it this way. I don't understand why they do. Why are they able to do this and we can't do this? Why are they able to do that and I can't do that? Why? Dishonor. Dishonor, dishonor, dishonor. People can be submitted to authority. Let's be honest. If you weren't getting a paycheck, would you stay where God called you? If you weren't getting a paycheck at the job you work, would you stay? If God called you to that job and the company said, no longer, no longer are you going to receive pay, but God said, don't, don't move from this company. I want you to serve them. Would you stay? Or do you follow the money? You know, God doesn't call us to a paycheck. God doesn't call us to a salary. Find me a verse in the Bible that says God calls me to a paycheck. Find me a verse in the Bible that says God calls me to a salary. God calls you. God calls you to a place. He can call you to a person. He can call you to a company. But wherever he calls you, he's called you to serve people. He's called you to serve a pastor. He's called you to serve leaders. He's called you to serve people. He's called you to serve a city or a, or a county or a nation. He doesn't call you to a paycheck. God understands that he can get money to you however he wants to get money to you. But you got so many people jumping around in life serving a paycheck. And what they're really doing is they're serving the demon of mammon. They're greedy people. People who claim to be believers are greedy people. Not all of them. But there's a lot of people out there jumping from place to place looking for a greater paycheck when God never released them from the previous location. And this is what we see in church. They jump from one church to another because they get offended at a leader or a pastor. People don't love me right. People don't, people don't care about me here. People don't love me. And they have these attitudes. Dishonor, dishonor, dishonor. They wonder why arthritis in their body isn't leaving. They wonder why sickness is allowed to rule in their home. They wonder why division is happening in their marriage. They wonder why. They dishonor. They dishonor leaders. Dishonor is an open door. You have to see it like this. Dishonor is an open door to allow the devil to come in and demons to come in and create havoc in your life. Have a heart of honor. Have a heart of honor. So honor can't just be something we do. It's got to become a part of who we are. It can't be a one-time action, but it must be a lifestyle that overflows from the heart. Overflows from the heart. You know what honor is? You know, Christmas is coming up. How many of you guys are good gift givers? Good gift givers. Good gift givers. I'm looking at the comments here. What's up, Jonas? Good gift givers. I want to be a good gift giver. But you know, there's people out there who are terrible gift givers. Let me tell you what I mean. They will buy you something that you don't even want, but they'll buy it because it's on sale because it saves them money. Now, is that a good gift giver? Mm -mm. A good gift giver puts time and thought into what does this person actually want? That doesn't mean you empty out your bank account to get them that, unless God tells you to. What that means is I'm not just going to go buy something that's on sale and then give them. I had one time for Christmas one year, I won't name the family member who did this, but they bought me a, like a girly looking beanie, you know, that goes on top of my head. I don't know where they got it, don't know how much they paid for it. It was a terrible gift. So, 
It's like I'm going to go buy slippers for somebody because they're on sale right now, and they don't want slippers, they don't need slippers, but you got it on sale. Honor, it can't. That's, that's how a lot of people honor people, though. They honor them because they have to, not because they desire to. Honor has to become a desire in your heart. As you, as you become more lit on fire by the Holy Spirit, as you pursue Jesus all in, honor will become a part of your lifestyle because the Holy Spirit will check you on attitudes. He'll check you on thoughts towards people. Honor isn't just up. Honor is also with people at the same level as you, and honor also runs down. It's not just up the chain. This isn't like submit to leaders. It's like, yeah, I need to submit to my leadership. I need to, sl- I need to submit to police officers. I need to submit to government. Even if I don't like government and what they're doing is wicked, there's a submission that God requires from us to submit to them. There is. Let God be the one to avenge you. Let God be the one to have your back. Let God be the one that steps in and helps you. You don't have to prove yourself. Just let God be the one. Trust the Lord. Trust him. Trust him. I remember I got pulled over one day after the shooting happened in Dallas a few years ago. There was a major shooting, and my wife and I were in Dallas, and I I actually ran a red light. I was looking at something. I was distracted, and I ran a red light, and a cop pulled me over. And he, uh, and this isn't a racist thing. I'm just giving you the facts. He was a black cop. I'm obviously a white guy. And I, I, I did not want to come across at all dishonoring or disrespectful. So when he pulled me over, I rolled my window down. I had both hands on the steering wheel. I was very much, I was very much sensitive to the nature and what was happening in our nation, specifically in Dallas. And that, that black police officer was one of the nicest police officers that that I've ever met. He winded up not even giving me a ticket, and he winded up helping my wife and I find a restaurant. He listed like one or two restaurants there because we're trying to find lunch, and he was a super nice guy, didn't give me a ticket, super gracious guy. So you can't base people off of the color of their skin. That's called racism. It's called racism. You can't judge people based off what color they are. All white cops are no. That's what's funny. You know, when I was when I was younger, I was at a church service and I was sitting I was sitting far away from the stage, and there was a bunch of ministers on stage with like suits and ties, and I was judging them in my heart and in my thoughts, thinking these guys look religious. And the Holy Spirit, and I, when I was I, like, my style in general has always been unique and different for the most part. Crazy hair, punk rock. You know, just growing up had. I was the kid who had the emo hair with the spike in the back, and I'd pierce my own lip. I'd I'd, I'd be in different bands, and and before a show, I'd, I'd pierce my own lip, and I'd get you know I'd get a fake tattoo on my arm, and put eyeliner on my eyes, and I wanted to be like a punk rocker. That was me. So I felt I felt a certain way about about people who dressed real churchy. Not always. I just felt like they were judging me. So what happened was I was sitting in that church service and the Holy Spirit said the very thing that you feel like people do to you and judging you, you're doing to these men on stage right now just because they're wearing a suit and a tie. And this is what happens. We're living in a day and age where now anybody, any white cop now is a bad cop. And any black person is a thug. That's the day and age we're living. We're judging people based off their appearance when they could be so far from the truth. It's funny how even white people, there might even be white people out there who think, well, man, white cops are bad. That's, that is called racism. There are bad white cops, but I bet you there's also bad black cops. There are, there are good white cops good black cops. There are healthy pastors and ministers and leaders and apostles and prophets and teachers and evangelists, but there's also unhealthy, sexually immoral, greedy people in ministry. You can't just judge it based off of a one-time experience. This right here, ladies and gentlemen, is the standard. I don't go to church for you. I go to church for the Lord. I don't preach for you. I preach because God's called me to preach. 
Paul says it like this. We do what God's called us to do, whether people honor us or they despise us. So in other words, I don't, I, I don't serve Jesus, right? I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't serve the bride of Christ when people only honor me. I serve the bride of Christ. I'll put it this way. I don't only serve the bride of Christ when people honor me, and then I don't stop serving the bride of Christ when people dishonor me. I serve the bride of Christ because Jesus died on a cross for me, and I do it for him. So whether everybody's against me or everybody's for me, it doesn't matter. I'm doing it for the Lord. That's the, that's the, that is the, that's the motivation for why we all need to be serving the bride of Christ. There are going to be people who dishonor you, who hate you, who don't like you, who judge you, who are racist, who are, you know, phobic in whatever way. But you do not do it based off people's response to you. If that's the case, we're going to be up and down. And this is where the American church is. They're up and down in their relationship with Jesus because they're basing their relationship with Jesus off of humanity, not basing their relationship with Jesus off of who Jesus is. And if we can base our relationship with Jesus off of who Jesus is, we will be consistent and we will be faithful and we will be on fire and it will not matter who does what, says what to us or for us or against us. It's irrelevant at that point. I do it for the Lord. I do it. Listen, it takes a humble heart. It takes a honoring heart to get there. It takes a submissive heart to the Lord to get there. I don't submit to my pastor because he's perfect. I submit to my pastor because God's called me to serve my pastor, and I know my pastor's imperfect. I know my pastor's going to make mistakes. I know my pastor's probably going to let me down, but I don't stop serving my pastor when he lets me down or when I don't agree with him. I only shift gears in serving my pastor when God releases me and calls me somewhere else, but until that day comes, it's my responsibility to get close with God and serve my pastor, have his back, support the vision of the house, and if I can't do that, I need to shut up and sit down and not cause division because the Bible says God hates division. God hates division. A key to keeping the fire burning in Oasis Church is unity, unity, honor, honor, and us backing the vision of our apostolic leader, Pastor Barney, and the elders, and us pushing that thing forward and not getting sidetracked with who thinks what, who's doing what, what's going on. We just honor and we support and we move the vision forward. That is the heartbeat of God. Sin will be exposed as the fire gets hotter. We're not called to be demon chasers. We're called to be presence chasers. We we run after the presence of God. We're not trying to, we're not the Holy Ghost sin police. Our job is to love people where they are and let the Holy Ghost expose what the Holy Ghost wants to expose. He's the great exposer, not us. Let the Holy Ghost expose sin. If people don't want to repent of sin, that's between them and the Lord. And then if sin gets to top tier leadership, it's up to that leader then on how to move forward with that. It's not up to the church people to tell leadership what to do with sin. My responsibility is to trust God with my leader. That's my responsibility. And if I don't think my leader is doing a good job, it doesn't matter. I trust God with my leader. doesn't matter what I think. I trust God with my leader. I don't want to stand before God. And then me, I'm going to be held accountable. You're going to be held accountable when we stand before him. He's going to hold us accountable to how we supported our leadership, how we supported our boss at work, how we supported the company's vision and mission. Or did we just show up for a paycheck? Promotion comes to those who honor. All right, let me share this with you. Write this down. Honor creates a culture for breakthrough. Honor creates a culture for breakthrough. Honor creates a culture for breakthrough. In Mark chapter 6, verse 1, this is the story of Jesus. And he's entering into his hometown. And he's there. And he could not do many miracles because of their lack of unbelief. Or because of their lack of belief. And because of their lack of honor. It wasn't that he didn't want to bring breakthrough. Jesus himself was walking breakthrough. People who encountered Jesus got breakthrough. Those who wanted it. Those who honored him. Those who believed in him. But look at what happens when we dishonor and when we don't believe in Jesus. Jesus left that part of the country, verse 1, and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. 
The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Everybody say amazed. They were amazed. They were blown away. They were, whoa, whoa. That equates to, that equates to people in the church today. This is the best church ever. Oh, this is an amazing church. Oh, the pastor's preaching is the best. Oh, it's the best. Oh, I tell you what, right now, pastor, that message is the best. Oh, the worship team. Oh, the presence of God is here. Oh, the worship is amazing. Oh, I've been looking for a church like this forever. There's not a church in all of Dallas like this. This is the best. Amazing. Amazing. Whoa. Wow. Oh, the leadership team. Phenomenal. All the youth ministry. It's the best. This is how people were with Jesus. They were amazed. Oh, Jesus, we're the best. The best. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Whoa, whoa, did you see that miracle he performed? Whoa, amazing. Phenomenal. Mind-blowing. The honor for Jesus was high. Look at this. I call this the landslide of dishonor. The landslide of dishonor. If you want to guarantee little success, little breakthrough, then just follow the steps of what these people did in the landslide of dishonor. And I promise you, you'll have little success, little breakthrough. But if you want to walk in breakthrough and you want to live in success according to God's standard and what God defines as success and what God defines as breakthrough, then do the opposite of this. In the beginning, their honor was high. And that's where everybody starts. They get saved. Oh, their honor for Jesus is so high. He saved me. And they really mean it. I mean, with tears and just their hearts all in it. He saved me. He delivered me. That's amazing. Jesus is the best. Three months into it, three years into it, this is what happens. Verse 3, then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And his sisters live right here among us. Let's stop right there. All of a sudden now they go from honor to now Jesus is average. Honor to average. You see that? Honor to average. Whoa, he's amazing. Where did he get the power to perform such miracles? And then I said, oh. Oh, G Jesus. Yeah, I went to school with him. Oh, G yeah, we played kickball together when we were kids. Oh, Jesus, I know his sister. I know his brothers. Oh, yeah, he lived down the street from us. Jesus. Remember, he's in his hometown. Oh, Jesus, yeah. Oh, yeah, I know Jesus. Oh, and they become familiar with Jesus. Familiarity, Brian Houston says, the pastor and leader of Hillsong, he says familiarity is the enemy of receptivity. And that's what we're seeing happening in a large way in the Church of America. The reason why a lot of believers are not on fire is because they have grown familiar with, in their relationship with Jesus. They no longer honor him the way that they did at first. In the beginning, they were spending every day with Jesus. They would go home and turn worship music on. They would pray in the Holy Ghost throughout their day. They would go to every church service they could go to. But now, it's like they go once a month. They find little time for Jesus. They say they love him, but they really don't. Because if you really love somebody, you make them a priority in your life. You can't say you love somebody and not make them a priority in your life. You can't say you love somebody and not bring them a gift. You can't say you love somebody and not live a sacrificial life for that person where it costs you your flesh and it costs you your own agenda. There are things that I do for my wife that I do not enjoy doing, but I do enjoy blessing my wife. I enjoy her being blessed from it, but in the natural, I don't care to do it. It's called a sacrificial marriage. Many marriages would be healed if they would get their head out of the cloud and serve one another and honor one another. Many marriages would be restored if the husband would take the lead role and honor his wife, honor and love her for where she's at. Many marriages, what they do is they, they, they show love based off how they themselves want to be loved rather than how, do those, how does their spouse want to be loved. If you'll find out what your spouse desires what her or his love language is and do that your marriage would be one step closer to restoration 
That's what happened because you realize it's not about me. I'm called to honor. I'm called to honor. So they're amazed, and then all of a sudden now they're familiar. There's a spirit of familiarity that's rampant in the body of Christ. They're familiar with their leadership. They're familiar with their pastor. They're familiar. You know, this. it's good. It's good for people not to become familiar with their leadership because when people become too familiar with their leadership, what happens is their honor for their leader drops and they stop pulling on the anointing that that leader has. And when they stop pulling on the anointing that God's blessed their leader and pastor with, then they stop walking in breakthrough because they no longer see their pastor as an anointed man of God or woman of God. They stop, they stop honoring their leader. So familiarity is a devil. It is a devil. It's a straight-up devil. Familiarity is a devil. Do not grow too familiar with your leadership. Do not grow too familiar with your boss. Do not grow too familiar with people that you're called to submit your life to. Don't grow too familiar. Submission is not a cuss word in the Bible. Excuse me. Submission is not a cuss word. Just like repentance has become a cuss word. Have you noticed? Repentance is a cuss word in the church now. People get offended when you talk about repentance because they want to hang on to their sin. They want to keep doing what they're doing and at the same time follow their little man-made Jesus over here. Their little Jesus in a box that they're comfortable with and the only time they want to talk to him is when they need something. So they rub the box and poof, here comes a little man-made Jesus and they feel like they've, they've had a great encounter with Jesus when really if they had an encounter with the devil, it was never Jesus. Because you can't man-make Jesus. Jesus is who Jesus is. There's only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus. You've got you to deny yourself completely. He didn't make this easy, like the American church has been preaching for years. It's not like, say this prayer, okay, you made it to heaven, okay, great. Now you can keep living how you want to. No, people will go to hell if they keep living how they want to. People will literally go to hell if they keep living how they want to. They need to die to themselves and go all in. We'll see more preachers raised up. We'll see more apostles raised up. We'll see more revivalists raised up. We'll see more prophets raised up. We'll see more teachers raised up. We'll see America get set on fire by the Holy Ghost if pastors would preach all in, all go all in in your pursuit of Jesus. Prophets will be raised up. Pastors, teachers, leaders, apostolic leaders. I'm telling you, America will be transformed. You can't keep living how you want to after you say yes to Jesus and expect to make it to heaven. You'll die and go to hell. He'll say, he's going to come back and say, depart from me, I never even knew you. You said a prayer, but there was no transformation of the heart. True salvation is transformation of the heart. You know when somebody's truly saved, when they have stopped doing worldly things and they have bought into the kingdom of heaven. They become pure. They become honorable. They become submissive. They become yielding to the Holy Spirit in their life. That's how you know salvation has hit their house. Just like Zacchaeus. He was a greedy thief. And when he encountered Jesus, he gave the money that he stole. He gave it away. And Jesus said, today salvation has come to your house. Why? Because there was a transformation of a heart. When you truly encounter Jesus, you can't help but let go of worldly things and cling to him. He puts a fire and a desire in us to want to go all in. So if you don't have that desire to go all in, then that means you, you're not close to Jesus. That means you're hanging on to something that the Holy Spirit is requiring you to let go of. Because when you cling to Jesus, he baptizes you with fire, and you can't help but to be all in. You can't help it. You cannot help it. Let's wrap this up. They honored him, they were amazed, and then they got too familiar with him. This is where a lot of people are in the church, not only with their leadership and pastors, but this is also where people are in their relationship with Jesus. They come and they worship, but their heart's not really in it. They sing a song, and if it's not their favorite song, they complain about it. If the AC is too hot or cold, they complain about it. If the sound is too loud or too soft, they complain about it. If if, if the message wasn't just right, they complain about it. They just they don't, they don't really love Jesus like they used to. Complain, dishonor, familiar, familiar. They crack jokes with people in leadership that they should never be cracked. They're too familiar. 
they're too familiar. They allow themselves to get too familiar with one another. The, con- the congregation gets too familiar with one another. They, they're not breaking bread in homes anymore. They're not, they're not loving each other for, for just, you know, for, for the sake of, you know, being. And this, is, this isn't everybody, but there's a lot of people. They're, the church is not ministering to the church in the sense of honoring one another and going out of their way and being the body of Christ. I'm not saying it's not happening at all, but there's a deeper level of consecration. There's a deeper level that God wants to bring his church into. So then it says in verse 4, then Jesus told them. No, let's back up. I skipped over. Then it says, after the familiarity part hit, his sisters live right here among us. Then it says they were deeply offended and they refused to believe in him. the landslide of dishonor. You ready? Everybody starts off honoring. Then they go into familiarity, average. And then what does it say? They were deeply offended. When you allow that demon of familiarity to grip your heart and your mind, all of a sudden now, when your pastor begins to preach, because you're so familiar, what happens is you start getting offended at the things that he says. As to where when you were honoring, you were taking the things that he says or she says, and you're allowing it to cut you and transform you. But now that you're so familiar, now you're offended at what they're saying because you're hanging on to your own agenda, you're hanging on to pride, and you no longer are pulling on that anointing from that man or woman of God. This is what happens. You get offended. So then what happens when you get offended? You ready? What does it say? They were deeply offended. And the fourth thing, they refused to believe in Jesus. So now, people no longer believe in the vision of the church. They no longer believe that their pastor should be in the role that they're in. They no longer believe that their leader should be in the role that they're in. They're offended. They refuse to believe in the vision now. Oh, this vision is just, oh, it's just hogwash, I tell you. I'm going to go to a different church. I'm going to go to a church where they're actually doing something. That's what happens. The devil lies to people. You know, the way you leave one season is the way you enter the next. So if you leave with offense in your heart, you're just taking it with you. And you're contaminating other people that you rub shoulders with. It's not healthy. It's not godly. It's not biblical. It's not scriptural. You need to get healing. People need to get healing. People need to slow down in life. And they need to allow the Holy Spirit to heal them. That's what needs to happen. They need to allow the Holy Spirit to heal them. It's not always easy to honor. It's not always fun to honor. Because it kicks against the flesh. But that's what needs to happen. We need to die to self. We need to die to flesh. That's what needs to happen. We need to die to it. We need to say yes to Jesus and allow him to consume us with fire that burns up flesh, burns up carnality, burns up demonic wicked mindsets, burns up worldly mindsets. That's what has to happen. So the landslide of dishonor. So what what happens here? Look at this. And because of their unbelief, well, let's back up to verse 4. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his hometown and among his relatives and his own family. Why? Because of familiarity. After honor, familiarity kicks in if we're not careful. That's why we have to guard our heart. Then it says in verse 5, And because of their unbelief, he could not do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Because of their lack of honor and their lack of faith, there was little breakthrough. Little honor and little faith bring little breakthrough. Little honor and little faith bring little success. Big honor and big faith brings big breakthrough. Big big honor and big faith brings big breakthrough. It brings big breakthrough and it brings big success. So what kind of life do you want to live? You want to see breakthrough take place in your life? You want to see that sickness leave your body? You want to see your marriage restored? You want to see your family healthy? You want to see your family continue to be healthy? You want to see your marriage continue to be healthy? You want to see promotion continue to come to you at work? Then honor. Honor your boss. Honor your spouse. Honor your children. When you mess up parents with your kids, humble yourself and repent. Apologize to them. Say, I'm sorry for overreacting. Hey, I'm sorry for treating you that way. Hey, I'm sorry I got 
got frustrated and I took it out on you. Humble yourself. Where there's lack of honor, where there is dishonor, there is lack of humility. And where there's lack of humility, there's always pride. Where there's lack of honor, there's lack of humility. And when there's lack of humility, there's always pride. The Bible says he resists the prideful. He gives grace to the humble. What, what I want to do, if you're watching this and you don't know the Lord, or if you're watching this and you do know the Lord, but he's convicting you about having dishonor in your heart towards your leadership, towards maybe your spouse, towards maybe coworkers you work with, maybe towards people in the church. Maybe it's, maybe it's people below you that you're, you just dishonor the people that maybe you're a boss, maybe you're a CEO, and you just dishonor your employees. You just don't really care for them. Whatever the case is, and you sense the Holy Spirit convicting you, I'm going to lead you in a prayer of repentance. I'm going to lead you in a salvation prayer. Mean it with your heart. If there's anybody watching who you don't know the Lord, and you say, I want to give my life to Christ, I'm miserable, and I know he's the only one that can, that can take this broken life and make it into something beautiful. He can, he wants to, he will. And uh, I want to pray with you. So, Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for every person watching this. Father, I lift them up to you. And if you need Jesus in your life, repeat this after me. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. Be my master. I lay it all at your feet. Forgive me of all of my sins. Wash me with your blood. Transform my heart. I give you my life. Today I follow you and I do not look back. I go after you. Lord, for, for anybody watching, I lift them up and I, I pray, Lord, they will humble themselves and repent of any dishonor in their heart towards anybody in their life. Father, we don't honor people based off what they've done to us or what they didn't do to us or for us. We honor people based off the value you placed on them. We honor our leaders. We honor our authority. We honor people we work with. We honor people that we serve Jesus with. We honor people below us. We honor our children, our spouses. You want honor to go up, down, and all around, as I've heard before. Up, down, and all around. And so I thank you, Lord, that honor is increasing in Oasis Church. I thank you, Father, honor is increasing in anybody who's watching this podcast. I thank you, Lord, honor is increasing in their life. They're saying yes to you, no to their self, no to their flesh, no to their own agenda. And they're saying yes to you and your will. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all. Praise God. That's what's up. Appreciate you tuning in. Great to have you on my podcast today. And I want you to have a great day. And maybe you'll see Bob Ross a little bit more. I didn't drink a sip out of this, I don't think, during the podcast. There is coffee in here. But God bless. Have a great day. And, uh, man, I'll see you next week.